I'd like to welcome down Dr. Gordon Finch to introduce our keynote speaker. I'm super excited to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Kevin Madison is um, Associate Director of, um, I'm looking at my notes here, Associate Director of Master's Programs uh, for Project Dragonfly and Instructor at the Biology Department of Ohio University. Uh, um, uh, Miami University of Ohio, um, and he's an ecologist and pollination biologist with a research focus on urbanized landscapes. Um, so Kevin did his PhD work at Fordham University in New York, um, uh, where he did really pioneering work looking at um, the effects of urbanization on pollinators, uh, combining insect sampling and GIS to evaluate landscape factors, effects on uh, bee and butterfly diversity. I'll say starting out in urban pollinator research about 10 years ago, I was super inspired by Kevin's PhD work. Um, and so personally, like very excited to hear this talk. Um, from there, Kevin went on to do a postdoc uh, in Chicago where he was co-PI on a NSF project looking at um, more from the plants perspective, looking at pollen limitation in urban landscapes. Um, and, uh, yeah, is, again, really foundational, awesome work. Um, and he's currently really interested in thinking about community-based conservation efforts. Um, and in this vein, his work with Project Dragonfly is really inspiring. I don't know if like you or like me, you thought that Project Dragonfly was like some sort of odinate monitoring thing. No, it is a really cool um, graduate program that combines um, distance online learning with hands-on opportunities for partnering with um, conservation uh, organizations worldwide. Um, and so hopefully Kevin will sort of bring all of these interests together in his talk today on um, conservation efforts for supporting pollinator conservation in cities. So with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Kevin Madison. All right, thank you, Gordon. And thank you, Laura and Anthony as well. I know it takes a lot to manage a hybrid um, event. And so um, the technical skills you are managing and troubleshooting are, are appreciated. But it's really nice for me. I had hoped to fly out to Toronto. That was the initial plan, but life got a little crazy. And so I'm really glad to be able to join from afar and also connect with all the people that are joining also via their computers at home. Um, so yeah, so I'll jump right into it, uh, my, my research and some of the thoughts that I hope will connect with many of you. Um, but pollinator conservation in cities is um, the title. And this view is the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, New York. It's actually about eight blocks from where I grew up. Um, and then also where I went back to after college undergraduate, I worked at the Bronx Zoo and I then joined uh, a master's and ultimately a PhD program at Fordham University, which is near this view you're seeing on your screen. Um, when we look at this as ecologists and as pollinator or bee people or beeple, as we like to say, um, it might be easy to at least initially think this is going to be really challenging to see any species of conservation value because there's just so much concrete everywhere. But as we all know, there's more and more focus on rooftop gardens, community gardens, um, terraces, all sorts of unique greening opportunities in cities so that and because pollinators are such in many ways mobile and adaptable um, early successional evolutionary species in many ways, they might be able to actually do well in these kind of environments, or at least a subset of them might do well. It might be an opportunity to connect people with nature in urban environments um, beyond just pigeons and all the other things people tend to think of in cities, right? So many of us have seen these types of figures, but the importance of urban ecology moving forward is that almost all worldwide population growth, if you look at the figure on the left, the red line is showing the urban population. And from about 2007 uh, or so, the world's urban population outstripped the 
line in blue, which is the world's rural population. And the projections moving forward for total population growth are that almost all growth is going to be in cities. It's going to be absorbed by cities. And so this is why it's really important to think about conservation and sustainability in cities, because that's where more and more of humanity is going to be living. And if you look at this other figure on the right, I just think it's amazing because some of these numbers, the, the growth from 1950% of the population in these different continental areas that was living in an urban location versus in 2020. So you can see the growth in areas like Latin America and the Caribbean is now 81% of the population living in urban areas. So this is something that I think many people, unless you live in these um, areas, would not necessarily think it's so urban, um, but it really has been a huge shift in just the last 70 years or so. When we think about cities, um, it's important to realize that sometimes they are stigmatized, right? Um, people have a notion of what a city is like, and those aren't always positive values, right? So this work that I've put in a table here on the right, it was a study of kids in the Bronx and their sense of place. What do they feel about the Bronx as a place? And this study found that there were some negative things uh, that people associate with the Bronx, um, the kids growing up there, you know, high levels of crime, poverty, some industrial facilities, underserved schools and pollution. But this study also highlighted all the positive things that are happening in the Bronx, such as family, friends, home, art, culture, music, community gardens, these sorts of opportunities to sort of reframe the narrative of a city and a place. And tied to that is ecology and nature, right? Because when people think of cities, they just think of concrete, but we all know there are these little gems of green spaces that are a part of that urban experience. So it's not like people living in cities are devoid of any nature experiences, right? I grew up in New York City. Many of you grew up in cities. And I went camping in the summer, fortunately. Many people have those opportunities or vacations. But beyond that, many people go and escape from the wilds of the urban environment into the wilds of the city's green spaces and the gems like Central Park in New York City. At times I've felt this rectang rectangular green space in the heart of Manhattan could be viewed as the most important green space on the planet because it gets more visitors than the Smokies National Park and the Grand Canyon combined on an annual basis. And yet it's this small and surrounded by urban development green space. So the importance, these are the things I've just mentioned um, of urban ecology are that nearly all future worldwide wide population growth is in urban areas. Many of us have been talking about that, thinking about that. Inner city areas are often stigmatized, but we can reframe that narrative and they can become areas for nature connections. And then let's recognize that cities are not just all concrete. They contain important green spaces where people can connect. And the final part is, I think, maybe one of the hardest parts and also the great opportun best opportunities for us, which is that within the actual neighborhoods where most people live and work, the most of the habitat you're going to come across is just these small front yard, backyard, or little greenways and patches of vegetation, even in cracks in the sidewalk. And those are opportunities for us to really get involved and creative about conservation. So um, I now get to share about a great love of mine over the last couple decades, which has been community gardens. And uh, many of you may know these are popping up in cities all over um, and they're built on abandoned lots. But this is just one I wanted to share. This is the view from inside of it. It's Fordham Lot Busters Community Garden in the Bronx. And when you walk through the fence, the gate here into this community garden, it's like you've stepped through a magic portal. It's like you've been transported into Narnia. And what it is, is when you go from the concrete and the asphalt and the some air pollution and all the sounds of the street 
and you step into this area where all of a sudden you might hear a bird singing or bees or other insects buzzing about and you smell flowers, it's a totally different sensory experience. And so just a very unique opportunity and experience for many people. And what's cool is these are community gardens. They are meant to be open to the community. That doesn't always get actualized to the level that it should, but it is the ideal and the um, idea behind them. So in New York City, we have 700 of these community gardens shown in green dots here on this map of New York City. Most are created on abandoned lots by neighborhood residents who literally do this out of their own volunteer time and efforts. And what's really neat when I looked at this map originally, and I thought, wow, it's like these gardens, it, it's not a random distribution. It's not like someone just sprinkled these green dots evenly across the city. Um, you can see like Staten Island down here, which is barely on the map and is a part of the New York, of New York City, right? Only a few community gardens there. And that's because Staten Island is more of a residential and less developed area. So people have private gardens, they have their own green spaces, but in the more heavily developed areas of the city, like the South Bronx and East Harlem, Harlem and Washington Heights, different areas, Lower East Side and parts of Brooklyn. Um, these are the areas where you have more community gardens because there's less green space, there's less private green space. And so people are making use of vacant lots to reconnect with nature. It's also that in those areas, these are lower income neighborhoods. And so there may be more vacant lots that are available, but it's really interesting because socioeconomically, these gardens are popping up and being created exactly where we would want them as ecologists and conservation minded people. So I think it's a great example of organic, grassroots, bottom up conservation in an urban setting um, exactly where we would hope it would be emerging. And I'll get into the bees because I know this is BeeCon um, and we got to talk about bees, but I got to talk about the people too, because these are, I think with urban ecology and ecology generally, we can't forget the people. And these are just some images of the community gardeners, the people that supported, were willing to support my research through the years um, that were welcoming and open to um, an outsider coming in and doing sort of a strange research project. I think that might have seemed a little bizarre uh, initially. And many of these people were interested in pollinators, interested in ecology, but they had other interests too. I mean, these gardens are a social place. So, you know, playing dominoes and sitting together and getting time to visit or growing peaches um, or having some sort of recreational area within the garden. So these are multiple land use. We can't just make them 100% a meadow for bees, right? We have to acknowledge the many different things that are going on here. And I'll just say the other thing, many of these individuals are absolute urban conservation heroes in my book. You know, they are people that have dedicated a lot of time and often not getting much um, gratitude uh, or awareness from the city about what they're doing. Um, but I just think they're, they're generally very unique, um, energetic people making a big difference. So my role as an ecologist was not to change these gardens or to implement my idea of what this should be for pollinators or anything, but just to add value, add an understanding of another um, additional benefit of these community gardens. In addition to all the social benefits, there might be an ecological benefit or an ecosystem services benefit in the form of pollination. So our first research question was, what bees are present in urban gardens? It's a pretty simple question. Um, we sampled 19 community gardens in the Bronx and East Harlem initially, and we did this over several years. Um, using both bull traps and netting. We didn't actually net from the car, um, although we joked that that would be an effective use of time because we spent a lot of time sitting in traffic. Um, but we would go out and, and, and hand net. And it was always a little tricky to tell people, um, we're trying to learn about bees and save bees, but we need to sacrifice some to identify them to species and have that scientific rigor 
to move the the state of the science forward. Um, nevertheless, people were understanding and supported it, and we were able to come up with some data on um, the number of bee species. Um, so as a species accumulation curve with the number of gardens here on the horizontal axis. So what you see is that a single community garden on average will have about 17 or 18 species of bee. Um, but what's really cool is the network. You know, if you have 700 community gardens or even if you only have, you know, 18 or 19 gardens, right? You're approaching 54 species or so in the species accumulation curve and it's still increasing. I think if we kept studying this through the years, we would have, it wouldn't have fully flatlined. I think we would have kept finding um, some, some species that make it into these community gardens here and there. But nevertheless, this gives you an idea of the type of species richness you might be having in a typical urban garden. And this has been um, also documented in a variety of other studies that have done research in all different cities in North America, really great research all over the place, as well as Europe and other parts of the world that are doing this kind of urban gardens um, pollinator surveys. Um, the other thing that I have to mention is iNaturalist, because many of us know and are, are engaging with this now. And if you go in and you search bees, you type in bees and iNaturalist. And like I was interested in Oxford, Ohio, where I work now at Miami University. Um, and so I just looked at this sort of small southwestern city in in Ohio and what we found was about 28 species uh documented in the city thus far with 446 observations um and when i looked at new york city uh it was 207 species and you could come to some erroneous conclusions from this kind of data like oh there's more diversity in new york city than there is in oxford ohio and of course this is a reflection of the vast numbers of people and observers that are in these cities. So iNaturalist is always going to be biased um, and give you perhaps an inaccurate sense of things because it's biased as to where people are submitting the observations and also identifying. Um, and I was just curious what Toronto, Canada had. Um, and it was 151 species when I looked at this the other day. And if we put these numbers, actually some of them have increased already. The New York data had increased since I initially pulled this screenshot. But regardless, it's currently uh, 229 bee species on iNaturalist for New York City, uh, 151 for Toronto, like I'm showing here, and then 32 now for Oxford, Ohio. Um, but it's just fascinating because if you ask most people that live in Toronto or New York, you know, how many bees do you think there are in this city or bee species, right? Or how many can you name? And we all know. Most people will name like five species at max or five groups. Um, so there's a big opportunity here to share about these common um, species that we see around, right? And to really let people get this into their lexicon, just like they might know most, most urbanites can, can identify a cardinal, hopefully. Um, we would want most people to know about the common Eastern bumblebee. Um, that would be a good one for us on the East Coast, right? To be really sharing about. And um, there it is, the common Eastern bumblebee. So speaking of bombus and patients, perhaps my favorite bee species. I know we all have to have our favorite bee species. And this one's rather um, ordinary, I suppose. It has common in its name, which is always kind of a negative, a negative thing, right? It's not super, um, doesn't sound very unique, but I just love this one because it's so um, active, and you can find it in so many unique places. And look at this pollen load on this female's back leg, hanging onto an eggplant flower, doing that work of sonicating, vibrating its wing muscles to release the, uh, uh, the pollen from the porocidal anthers that are um, uh, common to eggplants. So just an absolutely amazing um, species, very involved, incredible pollinator in New York City, Chicago, other parts, surely Toronto and other areas. And then the golden north, northern bumblebee, right? Bombus fervidus, another one we see all about, but just such a beautiful species when you get to see it up close. And, you know, now people with their iPhones and everything can get right up to these. I know people in education programs, um, if you dare, you can 
pet the back of bumblebees while they're foraging because they don't care. They're just involved in foraging. And it's a way to get back that feeling that many children will feel that these are dangerous and disgusting animals. I saw one of the presentations yesterday about people's perceptions of bees. So we have a long way to go to help them understand how, you know, kind of gentle these species are, um, particularly when they're out foraging and just minding their own business. Um, so uh, leafcutter bees, another great one to be able to talk about what's better than a fuzzy abdomen, a fuzzy belly um, out here on a marigold. Very common uh, genera in cities, right? They are about and doing their business. Um, uh, cutting cutting these leaves. And when I would show this picture to community gardens, they'd be like, oh yeah, I've seen that. But they didn't know what it was caused by. And then when they knew it was a bee and they understood that each one of these cuts is a nest, is a cavity for being partitioned, a cell for the young of the next generation of bees. And once they understood that, they felt better about a little bit of damage to that plant, right? So these are the connections we can really make in an urban context. And you know, when you see some of these bees, I'm not sure if the audio is gonna come and distort this too much, but I include it because you can hear here, maybe it won't come through, but there's, for this Anthidium manicatum on ironweed, it's a, it's a non-native, exotic, uh, non-native bee, and yet it's foraging on a native plant and you can see here the urban gray of concrete, the fence of the community garden. You can hear, I didn't really let it play out, but you can hear the sounds of garbage trucks moving through the city. And here's a bee just going about its business, not caring where it is, <laughs> you know? It's not really aware, I don't think, about all that detail we might perceive as humans. It's just getting some pollen and nectar from a flower. So it's a different perception, and there's a lot of things going on here that we can recontextualize um, conservation a bit. So one thing we think about a lot with conservation is the concern over introduced bee species. And one of the things we found in these community gardens is that 27%, over a quarter of individual bees that we collected in these gardens were non-native. They were introduced bee species, and it was 19% of species. So we had about 10 or 11 species out of the 54, I believe, um, something like that, that were non-native. Uh, and my first thinking was, well, maybe this is just emblematic of the whole sort of northeastern region of urban New York, but, it's, but even its uh, more natural surroundings, like Black Rock Forest is an area that's within a hundred mile radius of New York City. And it seemed like if there were all these exotic bee species in the city, maybe they would also be in Black Rock Forest, same with Pinelands in New Jersey. But when I looked at the published papers at the time, and more of these have come out, you know, it was a much smaller percentage um, in these more natural areas. So that led me to think, you know, the city, it's something about the city, not the region, um, that is almost like there's perhaps vacant ecological niches that these species are making use of. Um, it may be simply um, that they have are, are more opportunist species that can deal with the urban environment or are somewhat pre-adapted for that. And so this is an interesting area for study because I really, I personally don't, worry too much about, you know, these species causing a major, major conservation impact. Maybe I'm wrong um, on that, but I worry more about, you know, Apis mellifera and in, in certain contexts as a social species, um, perhaps out competing native species in some areas, but I don't worry quite as much of these due to their populations tending to be somewhat lower in number. And again, them being somewhat restricted to the more developed altered landscapes, but we should certainly keep an eye on it. Um, and we also looked at, you know, what ecological variables affect bee richness in urban gardens. So we did what a lot of these ecological studies do, tons of local variables measured, some landscape variables measured with green space. And we also looked at building units. So that's basically 
kind of similar to the idea of like percent impervious surface, but building units is a little bit better in my opinion, because it takes into account the vertical um, height of some of these buildings. Because if you just do impervious sur surface, you're scoring a 20 story um, apartment building or office building, the same as a parking lot. And really the um, tall buildings have a sheeting effect and they could also block movement or flying of bees potentially. So anyway, I think building units is an interesting way of, of taking into effect uh, the vertical structure of urban landscapes. So we measured all these and we correlated them with bee richness. Um, and essentially, you know, what we did here was we had this high resolution GIS map of the city and this was down to the scale of like one meter squared or so. I think it's even gotten better um, through the years. But if you have a community garden located here at the star and you think, well, maybe most bees maybe are foraging about 200 meters of most of the community, um, but we know some bees fly further. So maybe for them, they could reach Central Park in this case where the light green the, is the herbaceous or uh, grass cover or the canopy cover of the dark green. Um, so this was kind of the idea of the landscape context and how much does it matter and at what scale does it matter? So those were the questions we had. And really what we found was the number one ranked model by AIC, uh, most supported model um, with an adjusted R squared in this model of 0 0.68, um, just included total garden area. So that the area of the community garden itself, floral area and sunlight. So really these are all what I would consider local variables. It didn't include any of the things like building units or anything else. Now there was one model that did include building units. Um, so that's something for us to consider that it may have some effect, but largely our takeaway was from this was what many have come to consider as well, which is build it and they will come. The landscape context is probably important, but not nearly as important as simple floral area and sunlight, um, at least for the suite of bees that are already residing in cities and doing well there. So we then thought, well, let's do this in a manipulative sense. And we decided to add specifically native wildflowers to increase bee richness. Um, we had the correlative data I just showed you suggesting that should be effective. But again, it's a lot different when you do a manipulative experiment. So we took nine gardens and we had nine controlled gardens, unmanipulated gardens. We added 70 native plants to the nine gardens. So we would work with the gardeners to identify a spot where we could dig up ideally turf grass and plant these native wildflowers, things like um, butterfly weed and bee balm and a few others, things that are typically recommended. Um, we actually didn't just measure um, bee diversity, but we also looked at butterflies and predatory wasps as beneficial insects um, for keeping um, pest insect populations down potentially. So we did this whole study. We measured them for a few years. We would go back um, and test things. And we unfortunately um, ended up publishing this paper, which I think the title alone was a little shocking. and. Um, a little bit criticized, I think, because people don't necessarily want to hear this result, right? But the, the title was Small Scale Additions of Native Plants Fail to Increase Beneficial Insect Richness in Urban Gardens. And that's really because that's what the data showed us, was that these native plant additions did not significantly increase any of the measures that we looked at over the time scale and the spatial scale we were looking at. And our goal here was not to, you know, kind of be negative about native plants. I think they can be great, um, but it is simply what the data bore out. And we have to look at the alternatives of why they didn't work. Why was it not significant? Well, the obvious solution, one of them is, or um, explanation is that the native plant additions were too small and too short term. So of course, you know, we can say what many ecologists will say, larger sample size or larger manipulation, larger time scale, we could go that route. Um, but the other one is this idea that maybe urban pollinators are equally benefiting from exotic and ornamental flowers. 
And when I looked at the existing flowers in New York City Community Gardens, 70% of them were non-native. And when we looked at bee abundance on those native versus non-native flowers, we found no significant difference. There was no preference. Again, and we even at times pulled out the uh, non-native bees, right, in that analysis and still found that, that result. You know, when you look at bees, in this case, a native bee, Bombus fervidus on zinnia, technically not native to North or to uh, New York, or a butterfly in an urban context on um, a sclep or a um, uh, butterfly weed, or no, sorry, butterfly bush. Um, here, which is non-native, and some people are concerned it can be invasive, um, but probably not invasive in an urban community garden context, right? And highly, highly effective at pulling in butterflies and um, being a, a nectaring spot for them. So all of these are things that got me thinking about how we, what we promote, and how we best conserve pollinators in urban settings. So um, I'll come back to that idea of native versus non-native, by the way, because I think it is something a lot of us are thinking about. Um, so another study, though, and I just want to jump to Chicago um, that I did as a postdoc was bringing virgin flowers, which were cucumber, eggplant, and purple cone flower, to various locations throughout Chicago. And so we would leave these plants right at the height of their bloom out in a residential yard. We stratified the locations. Each dot here is a location throughout the city that we identified where we could, with homeowners, that we could leave these plants for three days. And then we brought the plants back to the lab, to the greenhouse, and had them grow and produce their fruit or their seed set. And then we dissected the eggplants, we dissected the cucumbers, and we were able to measure that pollination service, the actual production of fruits and seeds. So the goal here was, and the previous research was about what is the diversity, but here was more about what is pollination service look like across the city. And the size of these circles is the neighborhood bee abundance, because we also looked at um, how many bees were surrounding when we uh, did some, some transects around the neighborhood and within the gardens. So it gives you a sense that there was some variation there in um, what bees activity, what bee activity looked like. What we found in a nutshell was that, um, you know, for different plants, you need different pollinators. This is something we already know, but this is why it's important to have diversity in general, but especially in urban environments, because cucumber, really benefited from small sweat bees in the genus Lassioglossum and eggplant. I already showed you that image earlier, really benefited from bumblebees, um, bombus, and then purple coneflower. Agapostoma inverescens was a predominant um, pollinator, although purple coneflower is hugely attractive to a lot of different um, flowering plants uh, or a lot of different pollinators, I should say. So here's just showing the whole thing process, right? Here's the um, male and female um, cucumber flowers. Here is Lassioglossum caught in the act pollinating. And then here is your eventual production of a full cucumber fruit, right? So we need to thank this Lassioglossum, this sweppy, if we're getting cucumbers in the urban environment. This is another opportunity for education and making connections for people. Same with eggplant. There's the flower. Here's the bee, the bombus and patience. There's that beautiful eggplant that we're going to eat. Um, and then finally, coneflower, agapostum inverescens. And here's a lovely seed set. We don't eat coneflower, but many people do collect the seeds and spread them or just want that flowering patch of, patch of eggplant to be robust and to keep producing through the years. So it is a service. Um, even if we're not consuming it. The other thing that was cool about this study was that we found that fruit set for each of the three focal species we looked at was significantly and positively correlated with local pollinator richness. So pollinator richness in the garden and the neighborhood for all three species we looked at, cucumber, eggplant, and echinacea. So this is a direct... Um, demonstration of the benefit of biodiversity to a 
service, pollination and ecosystem service in an urban setting. And I think we probably need more studies to keep showing that link so that people can think of cities as a place that is for nature and is for ecosystem services as well as more na natural landscapes. We've also done a lot of work with citizen science and uh, we've done some training events throughout the five boroughs through time. This was a collaboration with a number of institutions, um, Fordham University, the Museum of Natural History and the Parks Department in New York. And this project was, was a lot of fun. We um, followed um, Gretchen Lebune's the, the Great Sunflower Project protocols, but we've kind of adapted it a little bit for New York City. And so initially we would give um, volunteers a sunflower plant if they attended one of our training events. And then we would have them take it home wherever they lived and set it out. In this case, it's on a balcony um, up or a rooftop uh, setting. Um, and then just watch it for 30 minutes and note what bee types arrive and up until a max of five bee landings and then submit that data into a database. So we eventually um, expanded this to beyond sunflowers. We allowed a few other species, including some native perennials. Um, so this, this program kind of expanded to a few different flowers and over several years, we conducted this, this work. Um, we called it the Great Pollinator Project at the time, but um, really based on the Great Sunflower Project. Um, we ended up with 132 volunteers and over a thousand observations from all over New York City. Um, and we found that 67% of the observed flowers received visitation of five bees in the 30 minute window. So that's pretty good news, I would say overall, um, that bees are active in the city, at least in many areas. It's not to say we can't do better, but there are bees and they are active in many areas. Um, one of the cool things, again, you know, I love bumblebees. Uh, bumblebees were the most frequent flower visitor. And um, I think honeybees only accounted for like seven or 9% of bee visits based on this data. So, you know, most bee visitation and pollination is by our wild bee species that are in the city. Um, we did an analysis comparing the rate of flower visitation to urban habitat type, flower type, and different landscape variables. And so one thing that was absolutely incredible for me to see um, was that the rate of viewing five bees in the 30 minute time window was 2.89 times higher, higher likelihood in community gardens compared to terrace or rooftop gardens. And that makes sense, you know, terrace or rooftop gardens are, there's a vertical element, there's usually more wind up there, it's not to say that they're not valuable as well, but it's just interesting seeing that community gardens were these sort of urban pollinator hotspots. They actually had a higher visitation rate than even private gardens and city parks. So um, really something unique going on there with community gardens that is worth celebrating. Um, and then, like I said, we didn't just look at sunflowers, we looked at garden cosmos, uh, we looked at, um, a goldenrod variety, an aster, a bee balm, um, or a wild bergamot. Um, and what we see here is that the native perennials, right? Earlier I showed data that there was no significant difference between native plants and exotic plants in the community gardens. But in this research, we did show that bee visitation was higher on native perennials than at least something like garden cosmos, which is a cultivar and is not really great for bees, but it provided a nice baseline. So anyway, just to say, bees are doing some good work in the urban environment as well. Um, and the other thing, this one might be a little hard to see um, fully, but you know, each of the flowers we looked at, here they are, annual sunflower, garden cosmos, all the way down, all these different perennials and different colors for different bee types. And of course, these were citizen scientists. so. We couldn't ask them to identify at a very fine resolution taxonomically, but comparing flowers in terms of bee visitation, um, this is from least visitation to more consistent visitation. So like the goldenrod got the 
most consistent bee visitation as a pollination service. And you can see that, you know, which species that it really varies, right? Some species are more dependent on honeybees, for example, um, than others, right? So this was just interesting to make that point again, that diversity really matters if you're thinking about pollination service because the bees care about what flowers they're going to and it's not equal across the board, of course. I won't read all of this, but this was how we tried our best kind of like um, articulate native versus non-native plants and their conservation value in an urban system. Because, you know, in reviewing and writing for this paper, we had all these other papers that indicated that many non-native species often considered to be weeds, such as white clover, red clover, dandelion, Queen Anne's lace, and there's others, right? are really important resources for pollinators in a variety of studies that have been done in Cleveland, Chicago, Lexington, Kentucky. And there's, there's again, there's others, right? And these are technically sort of naturalized by non-native species. And they're yet, they're doing a lot for pollinators in the city. And so we are trying to craft this message that we do not advocate for wholesale removal of non-native plants in all urban settings, and yet, at the same time, acknowledging that native perennials in particular can really do a lot of good when you have a setting that um, can actually handle those species and that they will be appreciated in that setting. Um, so I think this is just something, you know, people want very clear conservation actions, but I think in the urban environment, we have to acknowledge the value of some um, non-native plants to um, contributing to pollinators in, in, in those settings. Finally, the human impact of all of this um, is that volunteers that joined this project were motivated most by learning about bees. They really just wanted to be a part of something, contribute to science. We did a social survey of why people volunteer for this kind of um, conservation effort. And um, so yeah, just learning more. And then what was cool was some of the anecdotal quotes we received from people who just sat and watched, and maybe they came in concerned about colony collapse disorder or, you know, the insect ap apocalypse or concerns that like everything is, is falling apart. And, um, but once they went out and started looking, they actually, in some cases saw more diversity than they realized. And that was very re reassuring and exciting, you know, to see that nature can be pervasive in even in New York City or in these developed areas. That's actually a powerful idea, I think, for people to consider. And it's not to say that we don't have all these problems and these crises, because we do, but there's also a story of resilience and opportunity in these urban landscapes. So finally, um, the overall take, take home messages, I know I'm just about at the time, um, cities can support bees and other pollinators, right? Maybe it sounds obvious to especially those that are joining this kind of bee con, um, but I think many people living in cities don't realize this fully. And so I think we have a lot to do with education, build it and they will come. Um, they really will find a way, they're quite adaptable. Um, and then let's promote native plants where you can, but also let's recognize the value of some non-native, non-invasive, naturalized species. And we should also plant for a variety of bees, not just honeybees, of course. Um, I know a lot of people, honeybees are kind of their gateway insect into caring about more pollinators. I think that's great. But we probably shouldn't be putting a honeybee colony in every community garden in New York City or every natural, you know, um, nature center across the United States or other countries, right? We need to be careful about what we do with honeybees. Um, and then finally, engage communities in these efforts because especially in urban areas, they are ready to work alongside you. And we should take that and really embrace that opportunity. Uh, so with that, um, I know there's a lot of great practitioners, people doing exciting research. I wanted to give my email. Please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'm always happy to hear what people are up to, what kind of work they're doing. Um, and yeah, I do work with Project Dragonfly at Miami University. It is not about Odinates, but it's a great graduate program 
for people just looking to kind of do their part in saving the world. You don't have to relocate to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. It's it's uh, uh, like Gordon said at the start, it's, it's online with some international field studies. So the, my background on Zoom is from our Amazon field course. So um, it's a pretty unique program. We have a lot of people doing pollinator work. Um, so anyway, that's just a little plug, but I will stop now and thanks for your attention and I'll be happy if we have any time for any questions.